Have you ever wondered exactly when you should be making settlers in your Civ 6 games? Then you've come to the right place. Welcome back everyone, Herson here with another guide for Civ 6 multiplayer with the Better Balance game mod. Today, we'll be examining the meta strategies around producing settlers, including going over benchmarks for how many cities you ought to have with various build orders. This guide starts simple, but it gets into more advanced strategies that even experienced players can struggle with, so don't click away just because the beginning of this guide seems obvious to you. First off, in most games, we want to start off by producing two scouts followed by two settlers in our capital. Some civs deviate from this pattern, but by and large, this is the meta strategy for the vast majority of civs. Afterwards, we take a break from producing settlers for a while, making a district, a monument, or a builder, depending on the specifics of our spawn. The key thing to understand about settlers is that the cost of new settlers scales directly with the number of them we've completed. This scales linearly, and as a result is more harsh in the early game. The second settler will cost 37.5% more than the first one we produce, and the third one will cost 75% more than the first one we produce. Capturing a city or stealing a settler from another player does not increase the cost of future settlers we make, so strategies like killing a city-state in the early game can be extremely lucrative. On the flip side, if we had one of our settlers get captured, our future settlers will still continue to be as expensive as if we had settled that city. Thanks to the collaborative efforts of the top minds in the Civ 6 community, we have come to understand that losing settlers in the early game is actually a bad thing that we should avoid doing. As a result of the rising settler costs, we want to wait until we have access to the colonization policy card unlocked at the early Empire Civic before we make any more settlers. When exactly we choose to make our next settlers is highly situational. For instance, take this Nubia game. We want to get monuments in our cities, plus builders to make Nubian pyramids as well as improve our luxury resources. Plus, we want some districts to boost our Nubian pyramid yields. We finish all of these first, and then afterwards start producing two settlers at the same time on turn 26. One in our capital, and one in our second city. Obviously, we put in the policy card for 50% extra production towards settlers while we're doing this. We can juxtapose this against another game where we were playing Congo. In this game, we get a free builder from a tribal village, so we have no need to produce a builder of our own. We grab the irrigation technology to give this builder something to do, and have lower science than in the previous example, so we don't have any good districts unlocked to build either. Therefore, in this game, we start making our settlers 5 turns earlier than in the previous example, on turn 21. Lastly, a third example, this time is Abraham Lincoln. This game is very weird. We have fewer resources around us and lower production than in the previous examples, but we do have Mount Everest right next to us. Despite not being a religious civ, we make the executive decision to go for Earth Goddess Pantheon for even more faith and spring for the Monumentality Golden Age dedication to gain access to faith-buying builders and settlers. In this game, we only make one more settler, rather than two, before turn 30. To compensate for this, we buy another one right away once we reach Monumentality, choosing to buy it in the city with the Governor Magnus to take advantage of his promotion, which causes new settlers to not cost our city a population when trained. Now, in all of these games, a major question arises. In our government plaza, do we want to build the Ancestral Hall building or the Audience Chamber building? The Ancestral Hall is best for wider empires, and with this building we should generally aim for 10 cities by turn 50. The Audience Chamber is better for taller empires, and with it a good benchmark is merely 8 cities by turn 50. How do we know which one is best for our spawn? There are four main factors we should consider when evaluating our spawn. Space, chops, food, and amenities. The first factor, space, is simple. Do we have room to settle 10 cities? If we don't, none of the other factors matter. Just build Audience Chamber. Ancestral Hall is not worth building if your spawn doesn't have a lot of room. The second factor, Chops, refers to the number of harvestable features or resources which grant production and range of our capital city. Woods tiles, as well as resources such as stone and deer, grant a ton of production when a builder expends a charge removing them. This production is multiplied by the extra production towards settlers from Ancestral Hall and the Colonization Policy Card, as well as being multiplied by the Governor Magnus. 
capital cities with a lot of chops can stack all of these bonuses to pump out a ton of settlers extremely quickly, all of which benefit from Magnus's first two promotions. Looking at our three spawns, which one has the best chops? That's right, the American one. Congo's not looking too shabby either, but rainforests can't be removed until we've researched bronze working, and they only yield half as much production as woods when harvested. Nubia has hardly any resources to remove, so that's a no-go for sure. The third factor we should consider is food. How much food is available in all of the surrounding land? This is worth considering because the audience chamber grants a great deal of food and housing, which is more valuable in spawns with low food, such as spawns with a lot of plains tiles. Plains tiles have higher production than grasslands tiles, so being able to grow our cities tall and work a lot of them is a welcome benefit provided by the audience chamber. Returning to our three spawns, which one of them would benefit the most from the food and housing provided by the audience chamber? That's right, the Nubian one. This spawn has a ton of plains hills that'll become very productive once mines are placed on them, but is very low in food. Audience chamber is the perfect complement to this spawn. The final factor we consider is amenities. Amenities are super important in Civ 6, as they grant a substantial bonus to all yields in our entire empire if we have enough of them. Audience Chamber makes it easier to hit the breakpoints for having our cities be happy or ecstatic, thanks to it granting plus one amenity to every city with a governor. Furthermore, Ancestral Hall incentivizes settling more cities, which spreads out our luxury resources more and makes it harder to hit high amenity breakpoints. Having high amenities is primarily a matter of having high luxury resource diversity, since only the first copy of a luxury resource we obtain actually grants us any amenities. Each continent in Civ 6 spawns with four unique types of luxury resources, so if we spawn near a continental boundary, we can rest assured that we will have more luxury resource diversity, which pushes us towards an ancestral hall and away from audience chamber. Furthermore, some civs have extra amenities built into their bonuses, such as Abraham Lincoln and Montezuma, which biases these civs towards ancestral hall. Looking at our Abraham Lincoln spawn, we can see that we're right along a continental boundary. Furthermore, as we gain two amenities in every city with an industrial zone thanks to our civ bonuses, we know that it will be very easy to hit plus five amenities to reach the ecstatic breakpoint without needing audience chamber's help. Because the spawn is a lot of chops, a lot of food, and a lot of amenities, we go for ancestral hall here and aim to settle at least 10 cities by turn 50. Looking at the Nubia spawn, we can see that there's no continent split in sight. We have a lot of plains tiles that lack food, and almost no chops in our capital. Therefore, we go for audience chamber here, and aim to settle only 8 cities by turn 50. Lastly, the Congo spawn is the hardest one to decide. We have a decent number of chops and a good amount of food, but we don't have a continent split, and our civ bonuses don't grant us any extra amenities. However, there's one thing I hadn't revealed so far that tips the scales on this spawn. We have the suzerain bonus of the city-state of Zanzibar, which grants us two unique luxury resources that can't be obtained in any other way. With these, we can safely go for Ancestral Hall and aim for 10 cities, knowing that we should comfortably be able to maintain high amenities the entire time. Now that we know which government plaza building to make, and therefore how many cities to aim for, let's examine what these build orders actually look like in practice. In an Ancestral Hall game, our Magnus City will spend little time making anything other than settlers throughout the early stages of the game. We may place down a district or two when we can get them at a discount, but by and large we're mostly making settlers to take advantage of the extra production towards settlers granted by Ancestral Hall. Our other cities occasionally chip in to make settlers of their own if they've run out of other things to work on. We take advantage of Magnus's 50% increased yields from chops to pump out settlers extra fast in a city by making an occasional builder early. Once we unlock the feudalism civic so that we can gain two extra bill charges on all new builders, we do away with any restraint we've had up until this point and spam builders to remove all of the remaining chops near Magnus's city. In an audience chamber game, we can instead focus more on building out our infrastructure. This results in higher stats than an ancestral hall game early, as we're growing our cities to higher populations sooner and building more districts early instead of producing a ton of settlers. Of course, this is also just a very high quality spawn in general, so our pace is even faster than normal. 
We put out enough settlers to settle six cities very early in this game, and then killed a city-state to get to seven. And then, on turn 44, we finally produce one more settler so we can comfortably rest at eight cities afterwards. Returning to our Lincoln game at turn 55, we have ten cities settled with another settler on the way to put down our 11th. Thanks to our civ bonuses, our amenities are still in a good spot. We're at plus 4 in most of our cities, looking to be pushed up to plus 5 once we finish the Enlightenment Civic to unlock the Liberalism Policy card. We had to settle several of our cities, such as St. Louis and Charleston, without fresh water, but that's okay. They're both in range to build an aqueduct to a nearby mountain to gain plus 6 housing, and as Abraham Lincoln, we gain plus 100% production towards all aqueducts. In our Nubia game on turn 55, we have 8 cities settled, and everything's looking great. However, what's this? We're making two more settlers right now! This is because we realized that our amenities were higher than we were expecting. We're already at plus 5 amenities in every city, with the Enlightenment Civic right around the corner to unlock Liberalism, and Natural Heritage a little bit later to unlock Zoos. It'd be a waste to stay on only 8 cities when we could easily keep 10 of them happy, so we decided to pump out more settlers. This leads us to the final topic of the video how to properly grow cities which are settled late. You see, when a new city is settled in the later stages of the game, it's common to see that every district appears to be prohibitively expensive. This is because the cost of new districts scales with the number of techs and civics we've completed. In general, this means that we rarely ever want to actually settle cities this late into the game. However, there are exceptions to every rule, so let's examine how we can properly get cities which are settled late up to speed quickly. First off, we settle both of our late cities within six tiles of an established industrial zone. This is because we're going to unlock factories in the near future, and we want them to benefit from the plus six production of powered factory grants to all nearby cities. Secondly, we buy a builder in these cities and use it to chop the nearby land. It's not only the cost of districts that scales with the amount of techs and civics you've researched, the yield from chop scales with that as well. Chops can substantially speed along these cities, to help them catch up with your more developed cities. Here, we can see the Nubian city of <laughs> Shat, which was settled on turn 59, has already become a respectably productive small city by turn 70. And when you look at that, we're still at plus 5 amenities. In due time, this city will grow larger alongside the rest of our cities, and we'll need to pump out some more builders to improve more of its tiles and make the most out of its burgeoning population. That just about wraps up the content for this video. If you like this video and want to see more, be sure to subscribe, drop a like, and leave a comment down below on what you'd like to see next. All of these games are streamed live on my Twitch channel, which you can find linked in the description down below. Person, signing out.